International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. Dr. Dyson is a professor of sociology at Georgetown University, a contributing opinion columnist for the New York Times, and author of the new book, oh, and a newly New York Times bestseller, <laughs> what, what Truth Sounds Like, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, James Baldwin, and our unfinished conversation about race in America. Um, in this book, he focuses on a meeting that happened in 1963 with Attorney General uh, Robert F. Kennedy, and he brought, in, um, he brought in James Baldwin, he brought in Harry Belafonte, and other black leaders and entertainers at the time. And they started a conversation about race relations in America that remains unfinished today, and now, right here at the Commonwealth Club, we have Dr. Dyson here to, c to continue that conversation with us. So without further ado, it is with so much joy and excitement that I welcome and introduce Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Mic check, one, two, three. All right. <laughs> Look, guys, actually in the back, they had him with a microphone like mine wrapped around his ears, and he said, no, I want to hold the mic <laughs> so I can True. deliver my message with, with emphasis and power. Yes. All right, so first and foremost, you wrote an entire book mm -hmm. about a conversation between Robert F. Kennedy right. and then James Baldwin, Harry Belafonte, Lena Horne. Right. Uh, Jerome Smith. That's right. Who am I missing? Oh, Lorraine, Lorraine Hansberry. What, what was so significant about this moment that you said, I need to explore this in a, in a book? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, I'm so honored to be here uh, back again at the Commonwealth Club and to have the exquisitely intelligent and elegantly poetic <laughs> Roz Go Unwoody. I know y'all know her here from the local, <laughs> but she's big time now, national. So we, we appreciate her coming back. Right. I st I'm still mad at J.R. Smith, man. I oh, I'm my gosh. Still mad at I mean, dude, you know what? Know what time it is. <laughs> Do you know that they're auctioning J.R. Smith's game one worn jersey? Oh, my God. And right now the bid is for $3,000. Man, it must be a Warriors fan. It must be Joe Lacob. <laughs> yeah, right. No, right. I'm kidding. They want to thank him. It is him. not. <laughs> <laughs> they want to thank him. But to have a woman of her extraordinary talent and visibility and high intelligence to come here and have a conversation is extraordinary. I love her dearly, and uh, I appreciate her taking the time out of her extraordinarily busy schedule to be here. Yeah, I wanted to write this book because I wanted to read it. Yeah. And I was looking for a book, right? No, I was looking for a book about that story because I had heard, you know, about it through the years. Like, there's a big meeting, Bobby Kennedy, Attorney General, Harry Belafonte, I know Harry Belafonte. In fact, he did what you're doing <clears throat> now on stage with me when I started this book tour. So to wow. have you kind of bookend it is a beautiful thing. And Harry Belafonte had told me about the story. But, you know, I heard about it. I read about it. But, you know, what, what were the implications of it? You know, what drove the people there? How did they first come about? I, I, I knew some of the outlines. <clears throat> but to get more deeply into it is something I was interested in. So I had heard about that story uh, right now, it seems to me ex especially relevant because when you have white liberal politicians who are willing to sit down and talk to black people, it seems tailor-made, right, for conversation. But Bobby Kennedy was especially combative. Uh, people knew him as an SOB of a politician, which was beautiful, right? He started as not a henchman, but a fearless advocate for Joe McCarthy in the 50s. And then he evolved uh, into his position of being more sensitive to the issue of race, but not nearly sensitive enough. So when he invited Jimmy Baldwin and Harry Belafonte and, you know, Lena Horne and uh, Jerome Smith Lorraine. to that meeting of Lorraine Hansberry, it, it, was, a, it was a remarkable meeting. And, uh, but he got a lot more than he bargained for. Right. 
<clears throat> he was shocked. He was hurt. He was, he was expecting a pat on the back, maybe. That's exactly right. You're, you're, you're so right. He was expecting a pat on the back and for the Negroes to be grateful. <laughs> you know, be grateful. Okay. So uh, that's an old, uh, that's an old uh, Walter Hawkins uh, song. Y'all know, y'all, know, y'all know that, you know, some, some local San Francisco love. So um, oh, that's right. Oh, there it is. Old Town. Get it right. Oh, oh. <laughs> You know what? So true. I forgot. I, I, I thought I was a warrior leaving Oakland, coming to San Francisco. Oh. Oh, that's oh. how y'all do it. Draw energy from the black folk in Oakland, then come over to San Fran. Okay, I'm just saying. Um, so, yeah, you know, here, here they, wanted, they wanted, he wanted them to be grateful uh, for this opportunity to talk to him. And he wanted them to be grateful for all the great things that he thought that the administration had done. That is, his brother was president, Jack Kennedy. and But black people, they, they, they were smart. They knew that Jack Kennedy was playing both hands against the middle. On the one hand, he's telling black people he's going to support the civil rights movement, though he was slow on the uptake of delivering civil rights legislation. On the other hand, he's putting Harold Cox, who's a well-known bigoted liberal, bigoted liberal but he was a right he was very very bigoted and vicious more conservative than they thought calling black people the n-word from the bench and then he promised a governor a southern governor in in georgia governor vandiver that he would not use his federal authority to interrupt segregation so he was a tricky kind of guy and bobby kennedy was his representative and on the other hand, he not only wanted to talk about, you know, th- those Negroes being grateful, as they were then called, uh, he also wanted to talk about this, the, the North mm-hmm. and the growing urgency of rage that was being expressed. Right. Black people were being attracted to the black Muslims and not Martin Luther King Jr. and the like. So he wanted to deal with those two issues. But again, when they got there and the conversation started, it took a different turn. You know, you pointed out to John F. Kennedy, the president at the time, mm. and kind of how he played both sides. Right. And it made me think while reading this, like, this still happens today. There might even be politicians or leaders who are sympathetic to minority groups and want right. to make change, but they also don't want to alienate parts of their voter base. That's true. That's and true. We, you, you pointed out in your book, John F. Kennedy doing that. You right. pointed out R- Bobby doing that as well. Right. What's the middle ground for these politicians and the communities that need help while also being able to have the power to get voted into to create the policy? I mean, it's kind of like you got to walk a thin line. No, that's that's a brilliant way of putting it. I wish I'd have done that in my book. But yeah, it was (laughs) (laughs) second edition. Uh, (laughs) You're absolutely right. And it's the conundrum that black people, especially, but minorities more broadly face. How do you get with people who get power? Because you got to have some influence and sway within the official offices of politics. But at the same time, you don't want to sacrifice the legitimacy and validity of your particular outlook and get played by them. Especially, look, when it comes to Democrats versus Republicans, that's where black people are, too. On the one hand, you know, you got liberal politicians who say that they are concerned about and committed to our interests. But then they get in to office and they kind of play us. The Republicans, on the other hand, don't take advantage of some of the inherent conservatism among African-American people, culturally conservative, even if they're politically progressive. Go to church, Ten Commandments, religion, try to obey the law. So unbeknownst to many people, there are a lot of conservative black people, conservative in terms of moral orientation. Mm -hmm. And so the Republicans don't take advantage of that because of some strong pockets of resistance to reaching out to black people. And so Bobby Kennedy, to your point, your brilliant point, told them as well, and does, does this sound familiar? We don't want to alienate the white base. We want to br- bring them mm-hmm. back in. Mm-hmm. So let me get this right. I got you at the crib. You've been faithful and loyal to me, but I'm trying to risk my relationship with you to go out there and get somebody else who done already said they ain't faithful, mm-hmm. who are disloyal to me. So now they're trying to recruit white folk who were voters, right? The 2016 election was said to be about a, a referendum on working class white people. While you got black women, especially black people in the 80s, but black women in the 90s, faithful and loyal. Put Doug Jones in office down in Alabama, uh, voted 90% for Hillary against this uh, indescribable, unimpeachable mm. evidence 
of impeachability. So, so, so black women have tried to save this country and yet have not been rewarded with the kind of payoff economically and politically mm -hmm. that should come to them. And I feel like that was a conversation that happened in 1963 Right. 55 years later, you just pointed out an election in 2016. How do you make sense of the fact that we're still talking about some of the same issues? Yeah. And has, if things have changed, can you point out where they've changed? Right, right. No, that's a great point. Look, when Bobby Kennedy was speaking to those people, those distinguished uh, and gifted folk, uh, and, and worried about the next election because he's worried about, you know, politicians are always worried about the next election because that's their profession, to be worried about the next election as opposed to sometimes the substance of governance. Bobby Kennedy proved to be a statesman in many ways um, and to try to at least make a difference there. But you're so right. Um, he was worried about the next election. He was saying, look, we don't want to alienate these people. And we had, you know, after the election... Bernie Sanders, who's considered to be a very progressive guy, say that basically we got to watch out for identity politics because that's what the right wing was saying. Aha, see, women, gays and lesbians, transgendered and bisexual people, Latinos, African-American people, all that identity politics, what did that get you? Three million votes ahead of what your boy was, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but... Bernie Sanders agreed and said, look, I, you know, women's issues are important, black people's issues are important, Latinos, he said, but we got to get back to some of the basics of, of politics. So what are we, mincemeat? I mean, what are we? <laughs> Chopped liver? What are we? We are serious people invested in America as well. And everybody has an identity, including white folk, but they don't explicitly articulate it. When you're the dominant, you don't have to announce your identity, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, remember that story from David Foster Wallace? He tells the story of two fish swimming in an ocean. They're going along swimming. An older fish sees them coming the other opposite direction. He says, morning, boys. How's the water? They swim on a little bit and turn to each other. What the hell is water? <laughs> you in it. Right. Depending on it. Surviving through it. Breathing in it. Mm -hmm. Your very existence. And yet you're not conscious of that. Many ways what white brothers and sisters don't understand their race as white people, right? And even different ethnicities, Poles, Jews, Italians coming to America, Lithuanians right across Eastern and Western Europe. They were in, in their own ethnic enclaves. But when they come to America, gets remade as whiteness, right? Think about Noel Ignatiev's book, How the Irish Became White. So the point is that whiteness is a political identity. James Baldwin talked about it. He said it's a projection Political projection of identity is not something in your genes biologically given. So here they are as black people listening to Bobby Kennedy basically saying that we got to look out for the white folk there. Most of the black people then couldn't even vote in the South, especially now, as you said, all these years later, black people wielding enormous power at the voting bo booth and still get dismissed by a guy ostensibly committed to politics that are liberal, like a Bernie Sanders, telling us to do away with all that identity politics as if whiteness is not identity politics played large against the canvas of human history, right. and we're seeing it playing out right now. Now, what has changed mm -hmm. is that black people can vote, that black women especially have been ex ex you know, in incredibly important to the last several elections, and black people as a black you know, helped create the opportunity for the first black man to become president of the United States of America. The exponential increase in the black middle class, uh, the opportunities that have opened up. But then again, we have a, a also, you know, white spaces being, you know, in one sense, intervened on and intercepted, according to many white brothers and sisters. So if you go to Starbucks, the police get called on you. So if you try to have a barbecue out in Oakland, can't have no, now, now it's, barbecue it's, Becky. Come on, barbecue <laughs> Becky. Bar, calling the, I mean, it's un American for Negroes not to have ribs. <laughs> All right, I know. Okay, you're vegan, I get it, or whatever. Uh, Y'all are so she she. But, uh, but the point is, we can't, we can't have no barbecue in Oakland. We can't have no, no Starbucks in Philly. We can't sell CDs in Louisiana. The police shoot us. Can't sell Lucy's. Loose cigarettes in New York, can't breathe. Trayvon, though not killed by a cop, can't even walk in suburban America. Hence the film Get Out. 
Get Out opens in suburban America with a black man walking the streets. That is a mythology created because of the real instance of Trayvon Martin being tracked into a suburb, not believing he belongs there. So even as black people have created enormous opportunities for the first black president to become president, along with many other white brothers and sisters, but never forget, most white folk never voted for Barack Obama. Enough voted for Barack Obama with Latinos and African-American people to put him in office. But the vast majority of white people never dimpled that chat or pulled that lever for him so that even though he was elected, there was a great backlash against him. And then the man who's in the office now, who stands up every morning to excrete the feces of his moral depravity into a nation, into a nation, he has turned into his psychic commode, stands up every morning viciously appointing his intelligence what exists of it at issues that he cannot resolve and exacerbates the racial tensions, the class tensions. He doesn't like Mexicans. He doesn't like Muslims. Now he's got kids on the border in the name of American sovereignty, reinforcing bigotry and hate. This is what we have. That was a reaction to, and it's not just Donald Trump himself. He was supported by millions of white brothers and sisters who went to the polls, who continue to believe that he will be president. And I'll tell you this, there's a great likelihood he'll be reelected. Wow. Unless you vote. Right. Right. And even then, it's going to be tough. Why do you think he'd be reelected? Because many white Americans have normalized that pathology. They have accepted it as the price of business. Now, now we know that there were white brothers and sisters, working class, who thought he was the voice piece for them. Now, first of all, he ain't doing nothing for them. Right. This guy is not interested in poor white people or working class white people. He put in a bunch of billionaires in office, you know, as his executives, as his secretaries of this, that and the third. He has no interest in working class white people. His policies have not benefited from them. But what they benefit from is a kind of politics of resentment, thinking that black people and Latino people get more than they deserve. So Lyndon Baines Johnson said the following. If you can convince the poorest white man that he's better than the richest black man, you can pick his pockets. He said, hell, if you can convince the, the lowest white man that he's better than the smartest black man, he'll pick his pockets for you. So what Du Bois in 1935 in his book Black Reconstruction called the psychological wages of whiteness, they ain't getting paid with no economic payoff, but they're getting paid with, at least I ain't a Negro, mm -hmm. like, like they're trying to get your schools, they're trying to get your jobs, mm -hmm. right? And then they turn the same thing on to black people. They tell white people this is the case, and then they tell black people, hey, the Latinos are coming over here to get your job, stop immigration. You ain't getting up with Jose at 4 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so stop pretending that. And Jose shouldn't have to get up at 4 o'clock to work for $2 an hour. Don't be mad at Jose, be mad at the government mm -hmm. that turns against both of us to exploit us. So I feel like you discuss a lot of the things you just said mm -hmm. within your book at, at more length, but right. um, speaking on how Trump and the current politics of America kind of seem to be feeding on emotional issues, not necessarily mm -hmm. real facts or right. logic. Like you talk uh -huh. about race in America, you, you really can't talk about it without, as you, you touched on quickly, right. uh, the immigration issues right. happening right now that right. has the eyes of America on it. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's talking about fear of our jobs being taken, yes. fear of crime. That's right. Fear, these are things that bring out the emotion of fear. And so the latest thing we've been seeing all over the internet and social media, we're seeing images of crying children, right. um, families being separated at the border, um, Basically, the idea is to try and discourage illegal immigration into America. Right. But um, what's ending up happening is inhumane. It's, You're separating it, families. And so I, I'm curious for you to go even deeper. Right. How you would critique Trump, but not only Trump. Right. Also, the Republicans and the Democrats as right. well. Right. right. How right. they're both positioning this. That's right. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant way of setting it up. And it is true that Trump today in speaking said that, oh, it's a shame, as if, as if he's powerless to do anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, how horrible this is, just sad. Mm -hmm. um, because the Democrats won't act, and should they act, then this, in, this could end tomorrow. No, sir, you have the power and authority right now to stop it, because it's not a law generated by the Democrats, number one. It's a policy, it's not even a policy, it's a practice. It's not even a public policy, except Stephen Miller, 
who's a right wing conservative, who is a white nationalist in office, uh, not elected, but as a carryover from Stephen Bannon. Right. He and Bannon came in together. Bannon is out the door. One, one far worse than Bannon is still there because he has public policy chops. He's been he's younger. He's been at this for a long time. And his white nationalist views have now become uh, the mainstream within that uh, administration. John Kelly spoke about this uh, in 2017 when he was the uh, secretary of Homeland Security. So they've been plotting and planning this for a while. This is not a democratic practice because the Democrats would never try to discourage immigration, as you said, by separating wives and husbands from their children or mothers and fathers from their children. So much so that one man killed himself mm -hmm. because he was separated from his child. So we know that now when they say, oh, that's not American. Oh, it's quite American, right? In slavery, it was done. Indigenous people, genocide, it was done. You know, <clears throat> in our second world war with some of the Japanese internment. So, you know, it, it, there were there were isolated events and then collective events for this. So this is the worst of America. But now here we have a president who feigns a kind of powerlessness when he's written so many executive orders for so many ridiculous things when he could just step in and stop. And yes, the feckless Democrats who have not stood up against him. And let's be honest, the president who was in there before him didn't have a great record on immigration, right? Even though black people were celebrating Obama and progressive white people were celebrating Obama, he was known as the deporter in chief. He was deporting more people of color and Latinos and others than a whole bunch of presidents combined. So let's not, let's not pretend that we don't know his policies were deleterious and problematic as well. And the setup for this situation was certainly prefigured there. However, having said that, uh, we need to do more than talk about it. You're right, it's an emotional appeal to people like we gotta, we gotta stop these people from coming in our borders, we gotta keep them from taking our money, we gotta build this wall to keep them out. You ain't gonna have no better economy by building a wall than you have right now. And in, as a matter of fact, this man, this present president, is riding the political wisdom and prudence of the pre predecessor before him, right? We know that Barack Obama put in office and in uh, effect many policies that this president has benefited from. So in that sense, I think that we have to talk about the degree to which Republicans must stand up and speak out against what's going on, because these are the Republicans, like Paul Ryan, finally, finally saying, I disagree with it. That's not enough. This is why John Legend had a special word for him, <clears throat> <laughs> or two words, uh, on Twitter. Uh, I think uh, CeeLo Green had a song uh, that was similar to what John Legend tweeted out there. So the point is that these Republicans who are pretending that they are opposed to Donald Trump have normalized him. Lindsey Graham the senator was against him at first, calling him a, a horrible president and a person who had no conscience. Now he's in bed with him. Now he's cussing on CNN, saying he doesn't give an SH sugar honey iced tea about whatever you say about him because he's going to defend this president. These people are complicitous in the most vicious, horrendous, racist, and classist assault upon Americans that we've seen in the last 10 years to be sure and in immigration in the last 20 years mm -hmm. yeah. and they got to speak up and they got to do something about it and i think it's an everybody issue right it's not everybody just, it's not just the immigrants it's not just black people it's nope. not just mexican people it's all americans it's white people it's everyone together that's right everybody who's an american in whose name this is being done i mean imagine your children you know, they, they're tweeting out, you know, f happy Father Day, mm -hmm. happy Father's Day. All these politicians, uh, how hypocritical. You're in your home. What about someone that came in and snatched your child because they didn't like your politics? Right. And, and people are saying, well, um, what else will you do? People are seeking asylum, too. Mm -hmm. So they're try they're, many of them are running from horrible places where they have been mistreated. So we treat them all with the same disregard. And you got kids in cages? That's crazy. I mean, come on. So many white brothers and sisters and Americans of whatever stripe or hue or ethnicity would not tolerate that, would not want to be treated that way. So imagine us saying that this is acceptable 
in 2018, when we are supposed to be the moral police of the world and have the nerve to go around the, the world talking about human rights violations, even though he met with little Kim. And <clears throat> she's filing for bankruptcy now. Oh, I mean the other Kim. Kim K. Well, he met, for Kim, well, he met with her too. Wait right, a minute. No. He met with Kim Jong-un, with Kim <laughs> Kardashian, Kims. but he did not meet with little Kim. And she's filing bankruptcy. She needs some help right now. How could this happen, though? You know, we can all sit in this room and collectively say that's disgusting. Right. And in your book, you talked about the difference between policy and witness. Right. And on one side, if I can try to un interpret it in a very basic way, and you can right. go on and explain it more, I mm -hmm. saw it as, okay, well, there are politicians that need to make policies to improve the issues we're talking about right, right. now. But... Uh, James Baldwin and other people would say, well, the policy is one thing, but you need Americans to view these minority groups as actually valuable and human. Yes. It needs to be a moral understanding of why their lives and the way they're treated is important. So if you can look at a child who was separated from their family, put in a cage and feel nothing, right. how is policy going to make a difference when you don't even care to see that issue? So... You just what said is, it what, is, what is the balance? That, there it is. You just <laughs> said it. I mean, you just laid it better than, again, better than I did in my book. I read your book. <laughs> You're not supposed to be doing that. All right. Embarrassing the author, but you, 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 no, you that's informed brilliant. me. <laughs> no, but you, you said it brilliantly. How in the policy can't substitute for heart, right? So <clears throat> what must come first? Well, first of all, well, that's a great question, right? So let me answer this and then I'm going to get to that because that's a, that's a brilliant question too. So... Bobby Kennedy left that meeting going, oh, they, they just went off on me. They are orating. They're standing up giving speeches. He says they're interested in witness, like telling the existential drama, the urge, the urgency that they felt, the trauma that they had endured, the suffering that they had seen, right? And he was like, we're interested, and I'm interested in policy. Like, what's the nuts and bolts of that? How can we translate that into uh, public uh, policy and actions by a government, or at least an administration, that allows us to translate that witness? So, as you said, what, Bobby Kitt, what, what Jimmy Baldwin and them were saying, we ain't against policy. But we already have a policy, for instance, that says you shouldn't shoot unarmed black people. Mm -hmm. So that's the policy already, right? But it ain't observed because there's an animus toward a fear of a suspicion about black people and brown people. So the policy is one thing, but the witness over here says, let's tell the truth about how people feel about these people. Because it's not that it doesn't happen to white people, but it doesn't happen nearly as often and nearly as intensely. So why is it that it's happening toward black people? Now we got to deal with something else. It ain't policy. The policy can't keep you from doing certain things. But it's the feeling about blackness, it's the, the fear you have, it's the unconscious bias you have. So in that sense, what, what Baldwin and his confrères were trying to tell Kennedy is that, as you said, have a moral disposition. Let the president of the United States of America, your brother, not only have public policy that will eventuate in civil rights legislation, though that's critical, also use your bully pulpit to talk about the moral consequences of doing the right thing. We have a president now that we see the manifestation of the lack of moral orientation. We basically got a sexual predator in the White House. This dude talking about grabbing stuff and then trying to blame rap music for it. Bruh, that ain't what we do. <laughs> right? Biggie said, some say the X makes the sex spectacular. Make me look you from your neck to your back. Then, uh, then he jumped ahead. But if it's all right with you tonight, we're loving. Consent. <laughs> if it's all right with you we gonna get down otherwise not happening so so this dude ain't axing nobody right right he's not asking anybody it's like these right-wing conservatives who now make justification for young white men who go off and kill women and kill, become mass murderers because they can't, can't, can't get a date on saturday night the incel right the enforced celibacy. Learn, get game. <laughs> Learn how to talk. <laughs> go to go to go to school. <laughs> Mac 101. <laughs> Can you imagine Apple doing a computer? Mac, it's not just a computer. <laughs> so <laughs> go to a soul food restaurant and get some macaroni and cheese. Oh my God. So my point is. <laughs> 
that imagine then that we have a person in office who is immoral, who has no moral orientation, who said, hey, they're good people on both sides. Anti-Semites, yeah. fascist Nazis, anti-black people, hate Muslim and Mexicans. He says they're the same as people who are trying to fight it. They're just good people trying to do their thing. Mm -hmm. So when you have that lack of moral orientation, it becomes clear what Baldwin and them were talking about. Now, as to what comes first, that's a great question. Remember, Hillary Clinton was in battle with Black Lives Matter. Okay. And, right, right? And Black Lives Matter stepped up to him, and she, they were asking her, what is your heart? What is changing your heart? You know, here you were advocating super predators back in the day, and, and it's changed. And Hillary Clinton said, look, you can change people's hearts all you want, but if you ain't got no public policy, a change of heart ain't going to make no difference. She had a point. Martin Luther King Jr. said, uh, the law may not make you love me, but it'll keep you from lynching me. Mm -hmm. Now, if the law actually kept you from lynching me, right? Now, in some instances, it did. Now we know that, again, we have the law itself. The first interaction, the primary interaction, the, the basic interaction with people of color and the state comes through law enforcement agencies. And we've seen the disregard they have for us. So what comes first? Yeah, we have to have the context set through public policy to articulate a vision about what is doable and desirable in our politics. But we have to have a guiding moral vision that gives us a sense of why we should move in the first place. Martin Luther King Jr. also said that there's a higher law, right? Here is, here is Jeff Sessions, the supposed attorney general, saying that the Bible says that there is a predicate for separating kids from their parents because it says basically you ought to pray for people in office and you ought to obey the law. Dude, you reading one part of the Bible. There's another part because they use that with black people during slavery. Okay, Slaves obey your master, obey the, uh, obey the governance that is there. But we said God is made of one blood all men and women to dwell upon the face of the earth. There are revolutionary implications in the Bible, too. The Hebrew Bible. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And God says, I'm tired of all your offerings and your burnt offerings and all the religion. I'm tired of your churches. I'm tired of your mega churches. I'm tired of your preaching with your healing cloths. I want you to do right by people. So as, as far as I'm concerned, justice is what love sounds like when it speaks in public. So here you are as the attorney general. Here you are as the attorney general. Trying to tell people, I'm a Baptist preacher. I just preached twice yesterday. I ain't got it out of my system. <laughs> you trying to interpret the Bible with your whack-ass hermeneutical distortion that is philosophically emaciated and theologically impoverished. You don't know what the hell you're talking about, and you standing up there <laughs> trying to do this to people. So, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have to have an understanding of the moral orientation that will guide it. Martin Luther King Jr. said there is something higher than man's law. There's God's law. And when we appeal to our consciences and when we appeal to moral practices that are rooted in an appreciation for the other, that then transcends whatever on the books uh, that, that says how we should treat people. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. was willing to go to jail. Don't forget, they put him in jail. He went to jail. He wasn't selling crack. He was trying to crack the edifice of American apartheid in our own time and challenge it through love. So I think that's what comes first, our moral orientation and our understanding that we should treat each other like brothers and sisters and then develop policies that reflect that. I love that. So I now want to talk about white privilege, mm -hmm. whiteness, right. I, as you put it in your book, whiteness, but right. I feel like white privilege has become a really popular term, like a hot button term in society. Right. I just want to open it up to the audience. Right. Um, if you've recently heard about white privilege on TV, social media, if it's a, came up in conversations you're having with friends or that you're listening to or hearing, raise your hand. I'm just curious how relevant the, the term white privilege has become mm -hmm. almost everyone. So I, I feel like what's happening right now is there's an awareness mm -hmm. of this white privilege. Right. And also there are a lot of white people that are, that are feeling like, okay, I understand 
what privilege I have. Right. And they want to not only acknowledge it and be aware of it, but they also want to grow as people. They want their community to grow as well. And I want to ask you now, mm -hmm. so they don't, they don't feel like outsiders looking in on this discussion, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, that's a great point. It's a great setup, too, because I can tell I'm in the bay. Why? Because white people raising their hands saying, yeah, they heard about it and they want to do something about it because a lot of white people are going like, I ain't got no damn white privilege. Right? I, I can't tell you how many letters I get really? calling me out of my name. Right? I've, I've gotten kidding, called nigger so much by white people, I just say, now, just call me Dr. Nigger or, or Professor Nigger. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm asking you right Put now. Put some respect on my Put name. Put some respect on my name. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big baby up in this bitch, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even though I got to pay Little Wayne $10 million. So, so the thing is that they, they, they call me, I'm name, and like, I'm, they come up to me, Jiminy Cricket, I am poorer than you are. You know, my kids ain't doing as well as yours. Oh, there are, there's a lot of resentment and pushback by many segments of white America about what white privilege is. So let me say what it is mm -hmm. first and then answer your great question about now that I found privilege, what can I do with it? Mm -hmm. Now that I found love, what can I? Come on, y'all, work with me over here. <laughs> if you break this down. Now that I found love, what? Come on, yeah. What? 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 Come on, spit with it. Don't make me spit up in there. Have y'all heard that new J and B album? It's crazy. But anyway, <laughs> so white people say, "What? What is privilege?" Right now, partly what I when I talked about that David Foster Wallace story about the ocean, white people in privilege don't know they got it, or they don't want to admit it, or they haven't been taught it. Born on third base, think you hit a triple. Right? Think you did it for yourself. You ain't did it for yourself, bruh. Right? And then, you know, look at, look at how people got mad when Obama said you didn't build that, right? Yeah, yeah we did. He's an anti-American. No, he's saying that everybody had help. If so, you know, I'm a self-made man. If somebody changed your diapers, you ain't a self-made man. <laughs> so, all these men acting like they don't need one. They're right, right, stop. So, White people think of privilege as everybody got to get the hookup. That ain't what white privilege means. Remember during Jim Crow, you know what Jim Crow is, when the official policy of the state, the official policy of the state, white water fountain, black water fountain, as if white water was wetter. <laughs> it wasn't no better. But what was better in some instances was access to resources, white schools mm -hmm. versus black schools. Not that they were smarter than the black teachers. They weren't. But they had more resources to give their kids with which to treat their kids. Even now in inner city schools, right? Out in, in, in the suburbs of San Fran, right? Where a lot of wealthy people live, right? Tupac came out here, went out to San Marino, you know, all that, where, 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 where the people with wealth were and saw the contrast between what was going on in Oakland and in parts of San Francisco. When you got suburban schools, 60 and 70 million dollars, planaria worms being dissected for their chemical transmission of knowledge. You got, you got flora and fauna. You, 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 you got them things with fishes flying, what you call them? Uh, what, what the fish are artificially kept? Aquaria. Aquaria. <laughs> right? And then you come to the inner, you know, f f you know uh, computers in every you know, room and high-speed internet connections. You come down to the hood, you ain't even got running water in the toilets. I've been there. I go to these schools. Secondhand, thirdhand books still. And then you wonder why some people are undereducated. They ain't dumb. But if the textbook says Richard Nixon is still the president. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's, not, that's, that's like a real story. That's, that's not made up. Read Jonathan Savage, Jonathan Kozel's Savage, you know, Savage Inequalities. Mm -hmm. Right? These inner city schools are being viciously underfunded. Systemically, it ain't no mistake. Mm -hmm. So... White privilege there, right, is, you know, white folk who vote for, yes, we should have equality while they send their kids to schools that they don't have to send with black and brown people. And this is why there's a spike in racism among working class white people because they got to compete, they think, in their minds uh, with, for scarcer and scarcer resources with black and brown people. Now, if you tell white people, but during, during Jim Crow, it didn't mean that everybody who was white was going to go to Harvard. You still had to compete it meant that the only people going to Harvard were white. Get the point? The difference is, it, it doesn't mean that everybody was going to be rich. It meant that the people who had the best chance to be rich were white. Mm -hmm. So if you could get off your butt and work hard, like we were working hard, you had the chance to go and get rich and go to Harvard. We could get a 4.0, kill everything in the room, 
could not go to Harvard. That's white privilege. And when you accumulate that over space and time, it means that your kind has the possibility of doing well. Think about it. The Golden State Warriors. What about if they were playing in 1948? Ain't none of them in the NBA. Earl Floyd, Earl Lloyd, the first black man to play for the NBA died two years ago. Two years ago. That's in your lifetime that the first man who laced them up, right, to play basketball died because he was in your era. That would have meant Nate Thurman if we go back before because there were some great warriors before now. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, crossover king, right? Imagine if... Hardaway. They couldn't write, right, right Hardaway. Imagine if they couldn't play. Imagine if Michael Jordan couldn't play. LeBron couldn't play. Kobe couldn't play. Steph Curry couldn't play. KD couldn't play. Draymond Green couldn't play. Imagine that. And only the white players on the team. Who are they? <laughs> Let me see. Who was white? Y'all can't even name them. Omri, uh, Omri Caspi was on the team. Okay, look at there. We can't even name them. We have to have a layer. <laughs> look, we're going to have affirmative action for white men in the NBA. <laughs> We have to have the Larry Bird rule. At Someone least one. That's right. <laughs> one team has to have an Ameri American born. We ain't talking about these Eastern European dudes. Oh. They're killing the game, too. We need affirmative action for American born white men who have a spot on every American team, right? So here's my point Clay Thompson is half white. That's right. Clay, that's right. But, <laughs> but the black side is kicking ass up in there. <laughs> 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 I might look like a white guy, but I'm <laughs> kicking your ass like a Negro. So, so the thing is that, that imagine if they were denied opportunity. Babe Ruth did not hit home runs against the best pitching. He hit home runs against the best white pitching. He didn't play Satchel Paige. He didn't play Bob Gibson. So what I'm saying to you, white privilege is about rigging the game from the beginning so that the outcome is predetermined or predicted. Not what white person will win, that a white person will win. That is white privilege. And if you've handed that on from generation to generation, look. And then white brothers and sisters say, that, look, World War II, what was a bigger act of affirmative action than the GI Bill? Right? You come home from the war, what do you get? Points on a test to go to school, cool. What do you get? Money to help with your, your, your domicile, your residence, to buy and procure a home. And then you get points on a test to get a job. That's the coldest act of affirmative action ever. Read Ira Katz Nelson's book, White Sociologist at Columbia University, When Affirmative Action Was White. So white people have benefited so much that when somebody else gets some, they get mad. It's like if Golden State wins the next six championships. And then Cleveland comes along and LeBron is 47. <laughs> playing with his son because he want to do that like Ken Griffey, <laughs> junior and senior. And they win. My God, they're not supposed to have it. It's Golden State. It's their championship. We deserve to have, right? If you have a sense of entitlement as a result of what you have, then you have a kind of privilege that you're unconscious of. So that's what white privilege is. Now, those who recognize it, white brothers and sisters who know it, I, I, I wrote a book called Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon in White America, where I talk about developing IRAs, individual reparations accounts. Because you can't wait for the government. The government ain't going to never have reparations. So you individual white people can do it yourselves, right? <laughs> what can you do? Read about a school that's struggling and needs computers and you got some resources. Hook them up, right? People come, you know, people who are in your employ that you know deserve more than they get. They just, they just had a study. You, nobody can make it on minimum wage. You can't pay your rent. There are many ways in which white brothers and sisters, not simply in transfer of wealth, but tutoring young kids, taking seriously their job as mentors. And, and by the way, when you look at mentoring young black kids and who mentors them first, white women, first in line. Number two, black women. Number three, white men. Then number four, black men. Why is that? Maybe it's the racial dynamics, it's the leisure time and all that. But white women who show up, who do the job, who get it done, who, who, who make a difference in the lives of these young people. So that there are many ways in which white privilege can be deployed. White people can speak up when black people are being arrested. And then you remember they had that Twitter storm when white people said they did the same thing. They, they smoked dope. White people smoke more drugs than people of color. It stands a reason. You got more disposable cash. You can buy more weed. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm hitting the spot there. Look at him. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let me stay on that. Hold on. You can have more opioids. Right? When black people in this area right here in Oakland and up the road in, uh, I'm talking about in Oakland up the road and in San Francisco, but up the road in L.A., when the crack economy hit hard, especially in Oakland and then in Los Angeles, San Francisco too, late 80s, pathological, nihilistic, criminal, you're, you need to go to jail. That's why nonviolent young offenders got life sentences like Alice Marie Johnson who got pardoned by the president. One thing, he did good. But don't pardon one black person. Look at a system that creates you know, inequality to begin with. That's what you got to do. But there was no empathy for black and brown people. Now young white kids got opioid addiction. My God, we must not criminalize them. We must medicalize them. Mm -hmm. Now, I ain't mad at that. I agree with that. But it should happen to people of color, too. We need white folk to stand up and say that. We also need white people when stuff like, look, I met the woman. She came to my book signing in Philadelphia who took the, the uh, video of the Starbucks. I said, let me just hug you, white woman. <laughs> I was going to hug her anyway, but I'm saying that was an excuse because I hug everybody. I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> oh, man, that me too got y'all shook up in here. I see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, damn, it's tough out here. <laughs> Hard out here for a pimp. So, <laughs> so I hugged. I said, let me hug you on behalf of black people everywhere because you didn't have to do that. And your bravery and courage and le letting that go. And, and, and on the tape, on the look, look how old I am, the tape, the video. <laughs> saying, what are you doing? This is not right. The white man saying, wait a minute. You don't do this to us. We need more white people to go, you don't do this to us. Mm -hmm. Right? We need that. We need that. And 54% of eligible white women voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Lucy, you got some explaining to do. <laughs> because what we don't understand, I'm reading a new book, ain't out yet, the studying about slavery and how white women are just as vicious as white men when it came to treating enslaved people, right? Gender did not resolve the issue. That's why even now when we have these gender differences within even feminist movements and Me Too movements, the color nuance has got to be included because what's interesting when you say let's hate all men, that scares me as a black man. Because I have been a recipient of white hate already from women who see me on the elevator. My God. See me. Hold your purse. I got money. I don't need yours. <laughs> My car black. Now, it was green last night, but I just painted it because I wanted to have. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm going to charge y'all for these jokes if y'all don't. <laughs> so, so why is it, right? We have, we have, we have in our presence and midst a, a, a need to explain to us why it is that white fear is driven. And let me end by saying this. People think that, oh, it was just a bunch of hicks, white Southern people who voted for Donald Trump. The average income of the person who voted for Donald Trump in the primaries, and it wasn't that difference in the, in the election, $70,000. That ain't poor white people. Big business went for him. People with enough sense to know better went for him as well. Now, enough white people also find him reprehensible. And this is what I think about Donald Trump. As crazy as Donald Trump is, as insane as he may indeed literally be, what's even more interesting and arresting but difficult to talk about and white privilege prevents people from understanding this, especially white brothers and sisters, Donald Trump is not an aberration from collective whiteness. He is its fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Donald Trump is treating white America like racist white America treated black people. Now everybody's a nigger. Donald Trump has made a nigger of the entire nation. And white people don't like it. Black people used to it. White folk, Jiminy, what is this? <laughs> like, I'm, my God, he's, ir he's narcissistic. He's self-involved. No matter what you do, he's vicious and nasty. He won't change his mind. Welcome to our world. <laughs> we try to tell white people, hey, we can be smart. We can be intelligent. We can speak the king's English to the queen's taste. Still a nigga. Donald Trump 
has treated the entire nation like it's black. So now, did you see that Saturday Night Live cartoon I ended, that uh, skit where white people were going, oh my God, this is the worst thing, the election of Donald Trump, it's horrible. And then Chris Rock and, and um, Dave Chappelle, when they heard that, they went, they were, they were cracked up. I guess y'all forgot about slavery. <laughs> Civil War, Jim Crow. So my point is, Donald Trump is the manifestation of the logic of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And until we grapple with that, we won't be able to put him in his place. Now, I know he's out of bounds and out of control and crazy. And the thought that he has the, the football, the nuclear football, that at any moment a, a man as impulsive as he could change our lives forever is devastating. But please don't understand the underlying message that this is what a this is what a cancerous whiteness feels like to those who have been his victims for 300 years. Donald Trump is a fleshly thesaurus and a living dictionary reduced to one man of the definition of hate and resistance that we have confronted for most of our time in this nation's history. So with the um, remaining amount of time, right. you know, we've had a lot of questions sent in. Thank you all for sending them up here. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, there's one here that actually has a little bit to do with, I had one more question okay. too. So I'm going to kind of mix them because Thank we're on you. theme. Um, I'll start with mine. All right. Um, so in this meeting, mm -hmm. um, you had Bobby Kennedy meeting, not just with politicians, he right. had entertainers in the room. Yes. Singers, writers, all of that, uh, influential black people. Yes. I was, so my question is, and you've talked about it a little bit, what do you think is the responsibility of black entertainers? And I'll throw in athletes because that's also become mm -hmm. a part of the conversation sure. with kneeling, Ka Kaepernick, NFL, all that. But entertainers, musicians, writers, athletes, these superstars for the, the black ones, can they just do their craft or do they have a responsibility, a burden to speak publicly about the plight of African-Americans in America? Yeah. That's the first part. Beautifully put. Um, eloquently expressed. And yes, they do. It ain't right. It ain't just, but it's real. Right? I mean, the, the, the same responsibility doesn't fall upon Brett Favre. Aaron Rodgers ain't got no moral duty. Right? And he has a moral conscience. He, he's concerned about Congo. It's just that the Negroes in Green Bay need a little love, too. <laughs> so, yes, I think that people of influence with a platform have to speak up. If I'm supposed to be a so-called prominent professor and there are other white professors, do they have the same responsibilities I do at my school? No. Are they called upon by students of color who come to their office hours and ask them? No. Or white students who are concerned? No. But it's just real. That's what it is. That's my burden. That's my responsibility, what James Baldwin called the burden of representation. And when you have that kind of platform, because you come from a minority people, when you're in the majority, you ain't got to worry about it. If, if Justin Timberlake goes down, you got a million others, right? Mm -hmm. if, if Brad, yeah, well, <laughs> let's just stay on Justin Timberlake for a minute. Uh, oh, let, let Janet Jackson go under that bus, didn't he? Oh, I'm not, a, I'm not a Negro. I just play one on TV when I'm singing. I ain't no serious black person. Treat me like one, and I will turn coat in a minute and blame the woman. He got biblical, the woman that thou gavest me. She hath done this. Oh, oh y'all ain't with that? Oh, oh, he, he could bring sexy back after the CBS fiasco, but Janet got exiled for 20 years? And she showed a nanosecond the nipple. <laughs> Kim Kardashian showed everything God gave her and some more that she bought. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Lord. So, so, so. Back to the lecture at hand. <laughs> Returning thusly to yeah. the prescribed program. <laughs> yes, it is important that African Americans of a stature speak up. Muhammad Ali did it. Jim Brown in his heyday did it. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Althea Gibson, Wilma Rudolph, Serena Williams right now, the greatest athlete of her age. Who's better than Serena? Like, who's better than Serena? Like, nobody. Greatest tennis player, man or woman. I mean, I'm tired of McEnroe's mouth. <laughs> Talking about white privilege. You act like a brat, cuss people out, and get mad if Serena shows any emotion on, on, on court. 
Because we live in what Gore Vidal calls the United States of amnesia. So we tend to forget. White people write me who have Confederate flags on, draped on them, saying, you black people are stuck in the past. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I'm not black. I'm OJ. Oh. Okay. okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Portrayal Hill up here in San Francisco. How you like that juice now? Y'all know OJ did that. Stop. So I said it from the beginning. Okay, here's my point. We have a resp <laughs> we got a responsibility, but but speaking of OJ, OJ didn't think he did. Nope, I, I, I ain't black, I'm OJ. I, I don't deal with that. I'm not one of them. Remember when the white woman said, oh, they said, oh, there's OJ, there's a bunch of niggas. No, that's not, that's not, that's not a nigga, that's OJ. OJ was down with that. You see what I'm saying? So no, Steph Curry, KD, Clay, right? LeBron, Kaepernick. I had a dinner a couple weeks ago with um, the young man, who wanted, um, uh, Malcolm Jenkins. Holding up signs, because you ain't, you ain't understanding what I'm saying. So let me hold up the sign. Do we have responsibility? Absolutely. Because to, much, to whom much is given, much is required. And as a result of that, you've got to be informed. You've got to be insightful. You've got to be smart. You've got to know what you're talking about. And you've got to represent for those that you've built your career on. If you take the blessings, you've got to bear the burdens. And, and, and if you're a black person or a person of color or a woman, you do bear responsibility to speak up and out for those who are vulnerable and marginal. Or if you're gay and lesbian and you're out in the public and people look up to you, speak out on behalf of trans people or some young gay person who may be willing, wanting to kill themselves because they are a different orientation. You never know what your intervention will do to rescue somebody who's in trouble. That's the responsibility that we bear in this society. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to move on to the second part, which is right. from the audience. And uh, first of all, this person said, I love how you interject hip hop into your speeches and answers, which was exa that Thank was you. exactly what just Thank happened you. here. Thank you. And then they said, what do you think about the current state of hip hop? That Jay-Z Beyonce album is crazy. <laughs> uh, it's good. The Nas album, crazy. Push it. No, Nas album is nice. <laughs> Now I'm second joint on there with the Slick Rick. Come on, it's crazy. Seven songs, mm -hmm. a Pusha T album, beautiful. Uh, Royce the Five Nine, beautiful. Here's the theme here, over 40, you're great. <laughs> uh-huh, that's our revenge on you young people. <laughs> Trying to put us away in an old folks home the time we turn 25. <laughs> 30 years old, we're old. Only in basketball, <laughs> right? Here are these, look, look at the theme here. All of these elders in hip-hop making some of the greatest hip-hop black thought did you see that f funk flex uh freestyle he did and now he's got an album out with the what with ninth wonder i mean great come on young people keep up with this old man <laughs> i'm spinning stuff y'all going oh i don't know i have no idea <laughs> i have no idea as they say in uh, new york so <laughs> so yeah hip-hop is great but we can't help but you know, pay our respects and uh, to the memory of XXX mm -hmm. uh, Tentacion, is that his name? Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years old. Just lost today. Just lost his life today in a tragedy. Um, dead, killed in what, Miami or in the... Uh, they there. shot him in a car and robbed him. Yeah. yeah. In, in Florida right. today. I mean, this is, uh, this, is, this is tragic as well. Um, I'm a fan of all hip hop, all styles. I must admit the, the, the mumble rap... The hell. <laughs> I mean, I, I ain't mad. Walk it like it, talk it. Uh, walk it like it, talk it. I, I'm not mad, but first and comes, first and comes, hundred times, one hundred times, one hundred times, one fifty times, one fifty times, one hundred times, one hundred times. What? But <laughs> <laughs> man goes, know what I'm saying? Uh, no, actually, I have no damn idea what you're saying. <laughs> The hell? <laughs> Migos. I love Migos. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Them things say, hey, I love my hello. See your pretty <laughs> ass. You go, go, go. That though. All right. I mean, some say, you know, I like articulation. I mean, Biggie, like, was a mathem. What, what did Most Def tell me? He was a mathematician of flow. Who the mm -hmm. f is this? 
paging me at 546 in the morning, crack of dawn, and now I'm yawning, wipe the cold from my eye. It's like a novel, mm -hmm. right? Tupac, somebody wake me, I'm dreaming. I started as a seed to semen, swimming upstream, planted in the womb while screaming. On the top was my pops, my mama hollering stop from a single drop. This is what they got? <laughs> right, Nas, it's only right that I was born to use mics and the stuff that I write. It's even tougher than dice. I'm taking rap into a new plateau through rap slow. My rhyming is a vitamin hell without a capsule. I, I like that. I like what I can understand. Um, but having said that, it's an incredible art form. I just saw a movie, uh, Davi Diggs. You know who Davi Diggs is? <laughs> right? Right, from Oakland? Yeah. Trying to show y'all up here. Oakland, Oak Town. The town. <laughs> he invited me to a screening of his film a couple days ago, and it's one of the dopest films I've seen in a long time. Dealing with race, police brutality, making excuses for your life, literally rhetoric as a weapon of either self-clarification or delusion. I mean, it's self-critical about the function of hip-hop and the way in which it operates in the culture and how speech is critical to self-definition. So... I think hip hop is incredible and amazing. I mean, that, that Ryan, the book of Ryan, Royce the Five Nine, my homeboy from Detroit, what's up, West Side represent. <laughs> um, I mean, a, an incredible album dealing with all his relationship to his father, the pain and agony he endured. So, hip hop is still a, a great source of storytelling. And when you look at the Jay Z and Beyonce album, first you get Lemonade. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty tart to drink that lemonade <laughs> then you get fo 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 in response not defensive mm -hmm. but introspective and now you got the resolution right you got the thesis the antithesis and now the synthesis and it's a beautiful gesture and he's what 47 years old and beyonce is a serious rapper i mean who knew mm -hmm. beyonce got bars like she ain't just saying she rapping on mm -hmm. there go go get that album uh, very, very serious stuff. So I, in one sense, I know it's a lot of bad things happening in all musical forms and hip hop, but I'm, I'm encouraged by the recent, recent renaissance, the renaissance of f style. And, and, and I know out in here, I know a lot of, um, you know, mumble rap is like the blues. It's about cadence. It's about the, it's about the feeling it gives you. And I get that. So I'm, I'm cracking on them, but only with a, a kind of joke in my, in my heart. I appreciate all of that art form and what it's done, and I think it's uh, in a good place. Awesome. So, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we have enough for one or two, depending on you. Right, right. <laughs> okay, I'll make them real brief. No, 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 I'll no, I'll make them no. real answer, brief. Answer. Yes, no, maybe. We'll hang around. We'll, we'll do, no, 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 we'll do two more. Um, this one right here is from an audience member who said, in the age of Trump, why isn't there a push for unity amongst groups with common interest? Uh, all the, we were all able to sit here and she pointed out, or he or she pointed out, policy separating immigrant children from parents. We all sat here and agreed, that's not right. Right. How come some of these things aren't bringing Americans together more? Or if it's not, or if it is, where do you see it happening and how? This was a nation that when an Ivy League educated, supremely nice, lovely human being, occupied for eight years, the upper echelon, the top spot of American politics, willing to reach out to the other side, willing to be self-critical about his own politics, and many responded to him, and so many hated him. There is no mythical, spurious conception of unity that can bring us together because people tend to justify practices based upon their ideology. So if you dig Trump, you go, hey, what do you think he's going to do? If you Democrats would act right, then these children wouldn't suffer. There are millions who think this way. Please understand that. You know, we're, we're in nice liberal bubbles you know, on the East Coast, out here in the Bay Area and Berkeley and Oakland and San Fran. And we, y'all are, you know, this is a beautiful place to be politically, but the world don't think like y'all. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people out there who are haters. And a lot of people out there who think these people are horrible. There are a lot of people who think I'm the scourge of the earth. I went to Toronto a few weeks ago to debate Jordan Peterson. And, you know, he's this white professor 
prominent public intellectual, defending white male resentment, talking about masculinity, what we would call in other terms toxic masculinity. And there are millions of people, and I got all kind of nasty hate mail, trying to talk and engage. So there are many people who don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about coming together in the age of Trump, Trump is an exacerbating, Trump exacerbates division. He makes it worse. He, he gives strength to those who were in the closet before about their bigotry. They can come out now. Look at the spike in hate crimes against Muslims. Look at the spite of, of, of antipathy toward Mexicans and immigrants. This is pure xenophobia, which is it's a big word to hate, to hate the other. It, now, a lot of people, except for those who were brought here in change and those who were here as indigenous, y'all came over the same way. But now, third, fourth generation hates the ones coming over now. So if you came in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, Poles, Jews, Italians, right, Irish, you know, who, who came with the same, WAP, what did that mean? Without papers. Now, we know WAPE was a form, a, a, a kind of word that meant thug. So they were trying to demonize those who were coming over, but it meant also without papers, people who didn't have official recognition. Look at the Godfather, if you don't need anything else. Look how they came over, little Vito and Dolini came from the town Corleone. Mm -hmm. So they gave him Corleone. Then later on, he became the Godfather. Look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> Man, I'm charging y'all for this. I'm charging <laughs> y'all for this. So, so the thing is, we could get together if what LBJ said wasn't true, that so many white brothers and sisters who are poor and struggling or who are working class think that their biggest enemy is a black person or a Latino person and not the white overlords of American capital and political chicanery who continue to exploit them. If we could get rid of that, let me get in by telling this story. Martin Luther King Jr. in jail in Birmingham his white jailers came to him and said, Dr. King, you know segregation is right. Integration is wrong. He said, no, it's not. You know, it's morally compelled. So he asked, how much money do you make? And when they told him, he said, hell, you need to be out here marching with us. <laughs> white folk who are working class and poor join with black and brown people and upwardly mobile people and intelligent and conscientious white brothers and sisters and others across. We could turn this world upside down and this country would be great. But the payoff of white resentment, the payoff of white bigotry is so deeply ensconced in this country that I'm afraid we won't be able to overcome it. There are pockets of resistance, but not all of us collectively together. All right, last question right here. And it, it's a little bit of a look to the future, the present and the future. Mm -hmm. um, there is one word that is sometimes triggering, but I'm going to read the question as is. Mm -hmm. um, do you think millennials and young people are more colorblind? No. Now, let me tell you what. Neither should they be. First of all, that's not an ideal. I don't want people to be blind in my color. I don't want people to transcend race. Just transcend what you think about my race. Right? I'm, I've been majoring in blackness for 59 years. <laughs> I can't get no new major. <laughs> Usually what it has meant to be American is to de-emphasize. Don't speak Spanish. That's why the, the white lawyer in New York went off. He just mad because people speak in Spanish. <laughs> my God. Do people have a right to talk? Como se amo? Me amo el señor Dice? Can we say that? Je parle un peu de français. I guess that's better. Das ist fair boating. East being I'm belling. You know, that's good. I ain't first the book of sons of God. That's good. What, what, what language you want? I'm a gizzo to the stizzo. Riz I niz out, briz other. <laughs> so we live in a country where we have, we have so de emphasized difference in deference to a notion of togetherness that what it means to be an American, as Du Bois said in 1903, is to bleach yourself in whiteness. No. White folk, let them be white. They're beautiful at it. Wonderful. Let other people be good at what they do. Let's be who we are and still be American and still be accepted as American. Built this country, built this nation, and so on. So I don't want you to be colorblind. I, I get what the ideal is. Like, you know, people say, I don't even see color. Really? 
Mm-hmm. You don't see me. You don't see my hair, my nostrils, <laughs> my skin. I'm yellow. You don't see darker people. Uh-huh. Really? You didn't see Michael Jordan was darker than Steph Curry? <laughs> or Draymond Green? <laughs> right? That beautiful chocolate resonance that if off the court gets stopped at six, what is he, nine, six, eight, what is he? He plays above his height, though. He punches above his weight. <laughs> That's what Detroit does for you, son. <laughs> so that, that beautiful chocolate with that beautiful smile in the wrong place, you don't see that? Right? I know what you mean, but, but mean what you say. Of course you see it. You shouldn't be ashamed. I know it's hard to be white like Jiminy Cricket. Do I say it or not? <laughs> do I acknowledge that you're black or not? <laughs> if I say it, you're mad. And if I don't, you're upset. What's a white guy to do? And I get it. It's hard being white out here. <laughs> hard being white out here. When you've been running shit. <laughs> but now when we share, it's difficult. So this is what we do. Let's all acknowledge difference and diversity of who we are. It's like telling a gay person, I don't even know you're gay. <laughs> really, though. I'm, on, I'm gay on purpose. I'm upset you don't know I'm gay, right? So, so colorblindness, let me tell you a study of the Pew of the Pew Report that did a study of millennials. And this is what it found. With the exception of interracial relationships, because hey, after all, love is love. Love the one you're with. Rap music that made us all one nation. So we feel intimate toward all. With the exception of interracial relationships, millennials think the same way about race as their parents and grandparents. Millennials think we spend too much time talking about race. Black and brown people get too much love. They don't get recognized for the barriers they confront. Wait a minute. This is the reproduction of the same pathology of an earlier generation. So don't believe in what Martin Luther King Jr. talked about in the 19th century, the cult of progress, that it rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. You got to be deliberate. You got to be on purpose trying to challenge some of this bigotry out here. So young people with the exception of having interracial relationships, don't think any differently than their parents and grandparents. The ideal is not color blindness. The ideal is equality. The ideal is no matter who you are and what you are, that we accept and accentuate and highlight the beauty of that, and then we embrace each other for who we are, and we can still have difference without hierarchy. And when we get to that point, and look, it it happens in all all of our uh, culture. In African-American culture, light, bright, and almost white like me, curly hair, glass-wearing Negro, right? People think, oh my God, he's relatively more intelligent. My darker-skinned brother who's been in prison for 29 years, I ain't saying he went to prison because he was dark-skinned. I'm saying that part of the judgment on his life was rendered as a result of him being dark. Even teachers thought that he was gonna have a harder time and that he wasn't as smart, right? Making judgments based upon skin shade. You know that light, bright, almost white, right? And so the differences that play out even within African-American culture, much less the dominant culture. My daddy was blue black. Mm -hmm. I'm a dark, dark, for real dark black. And I saw how people mistreated him, black and white, and beyond the community and within it. And so I was very sensitive to that from the very beginning. And, And when I talk about white privilege, let's talk about light privilege too. And how that plays out in the world. But then when we come together to acknowledge who we are, I don't want, I don't want black women to be nothing but who they is. And I'm going to say black women, I'm in on this because, you see, what's interesting is that, look, I'm from the 70s. I love all the women of the world. <laughs> That's how we did it. Larry, cancer, float, float, float on. We love everybody. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> but the reason I wrote a book called Why I Love Black Women Cause I was tired of black women getting dissed by their own kids in hip hop, bitch, ho, skeezer, slut, hood, rat, chicken head. The world wanted everything they had that they could buy, but the women born with it got dissed. Big lips on Cicely Tyson were demonized and then on Kim Kardashian elevated, right? Natural born gluteus emphasis on Maximus. <laughs> <laughs> that God gave you, right? The batteries were included at birth. 
versus being bought. Now, if you bought it, I ain't mad at you. It's yours. I get it. I'm not mad at you. I'm not trying to diss you. It's yours. But I'm saying the people who are naturally gifted with it are, are demonized. So, so, so I celebrate the unique appeal and the beautiful character of black women because they have been so discarded both by the men in their own community and by others as well. So I elevate and celebrate, and that's a great note to end on because I'm grateful for this brilliant, beautiful black woman sitting next to me, <laughs> high intelligence, <laughs> great achievement, sweet as she can be for the people, and an elegant example of ebony ecstasy and furled in coffee flesh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and insight here today. And it's such an honor to be here having this discussion with you. I'd like you all one time to just give it up for Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. <laughs> And Ms. Roz, go unwundy. <laughs> Thank you. 